Thanks, Jim. The, um, if you would, this morning, take your Bibles uh, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I promised Tom I wouldn't uh, would jump into the baptistry with my lapel mic on. <laughs> so I'm just putting it on now. So bear with me. Tom, is that not on yet? No, not, not on. I didn't uh, I think it's all now. Testing, testing. There it is. Oh, yep. okay, good. Um, it's not the way I normally have it, but it doesn't matter for today. Take your Bibles, as I said, to um, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to continue looking at the breastplate of righteousness. We've been studying our study through Ephesians. We've come to the point in Ephesians chapter 6 where the Word of God tells us to put on the armor of God. Why? So we may stand against the devil. Why? Because we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. We're told that there in verse, um, in verse uh, 10, uh, in verse 12. Um, of that text, and then in verse 14 down through verse 20, if I'm not mistaken, or somewhere down in that area, we are given the armament uh, of the of the believer, what we are armed with. And in Ephesians chapter chapter 6 and verse 14, we looked at last week, we looked at the uh, first part of this, where it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And so today, I'd like us to look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14, the second part of that verse. That second part basically says this. I put it on PowerPoint. It says, stand therefore. That's the command we've been given. You and I need to stand for Jesus Christ. You and I need to take a, a strong stand in a society that we live in today where the world says, I can do whatever I want, however I want, whenever I want. And uh, God says, no, that's not the way it is. The way you need to walk in a, in a manner that is, um, that is worthy of me. And it's interesting, if you take your Bibles and go over to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, when Paul started talking about the practical application to the Christian life, he starts out chapter 4 with verse 1, where he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk what? To walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. You are called as a Christian. You are called as a, as a believer. You are called as one who's going to represent Jesus Christ. And if you represent Jesus Christ, you need to live that way. And that's what Paul's trying to get through to the Christians here in Ephesians 6, as he talked about the family, as he talked about all different aspects of our Christian walk, walking in light, walking in love, walking in wisdom. Uh, you know, he talks about how to do that, how, how to have a relationship with the boss, how to have a relationship with children, all those kind of things. That's what we find here in Ephesians 4 down through chapter 6. And he gets to chapter 6 and he says, listen, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against our neighbors. We don't wrestle against people. But it's a spiritual battle that we face. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a spiritual thing. And he says, to be able to stand, you need to put on this armor of God. Let's open with a word of prayer and then we're going to look at this breastplate of righteousness. Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege today of studying your word. And Lord, help me get through this passage today. Lord, it's just a few words, but Lord, it's a, it's a huge context <coughs> in, the, in the word of God with regards to righteousness. And so, Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds. Enable it not to be my words, but your words. Enable the Spirit to work mightily here today, that we may be people who are willing to walk worthy of the calling with which we are called. Lord, I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 14 tells us several things. One, we need to stand. The Word of God makes that clear, that you and I have to stand. That's the command that's been given. We need to be ready. It's interesting. Some of the other translations, as you look at various translations, and some of you might have other translations, but the, but the contemporary English version says, be ready. Not just stand. It says, be ready. The, um, the English Standard Version uses the word stand, as, as does King James and the New King James. The NIV says, stand firm. That idea of not moving, that idea of not being tossed to and fro, but standing our ground, not retreating, not running away, um, but standing where God has planted us. There's a track, I don't know if we have it out on our track rack, but there's a track that says bloom where you're planted. 
And the idea is where God places you is where you ought to be standing, and you ought to be standing as a lighthouse for God, sharing the gospel with people wherever it is. And sometimes we get opposition for, for that. But the Word of God tells us we need to stand firm. The Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible, the man who wrote the Amplified Bible, took the, took the Bible and then he, 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 um, he gave explanation to certain words. He says, the, uh, he says, stand means to hold your ground. That is what we've been commanded to do. That's what we have to do. See, and I believe that Paul, when he's writing this, he's writing to believers. And I believe that because the Word of God says, first of all, here in this text, having to put on. I said last week that I really struggled with this, with this past tense. You know, we, we, we need to put on the whole armor of God that we may stand against the devil. And then it says, you have already done this. Paul's writing to Christians and he's saying, listen, you have already put on righteousness. When? When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. The Word of God makes that clear that, uh, that we have this, um, this stand in Christ. Take your Bibles over to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1, it says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Many months ago we looked at this verse and we broke it apart. But it says there the author, Paul, wrote this. And who did he write it to? He wrote it to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ. He's writing to a group of people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the Word of God tells us that when we know Jesus Christ, and when we accept Him, He puts on this robe of righteousness. And these believers have this righteousness. We need to not forget that. There's a second aspect to this verse. And this verse says, having put on the breast, having put on, and then it says the breastplate. And I want us to consider just for a minute this breastplate. What is a breastplate? The breastplate is a piece of armament that the Roman soldiers would wear or that a lot of the soldiers would wear. And it would go from the neck down to the waist and it would protect the body. Basically, it was protecting the heart. As I, uh, as I thought about this protection of the heart, I thought to myself, you know, what does the Bible say about the heart? I believe the best definition that I came across with regards to what the heart is to us as believers is a simple two-word uh, two definition. Control center. The heart controls who we are and what we do. You might say, well, is that the case? Is that true? Well, the Word of God tells us these things. You know, um, in, the, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 15, in verses 18 through 20, it says this. But those things which proceed out of your mouth comes from the what? The heart. Comes from the heart. See, we need to understand that the heart is a place that controls who we are. Okay, it goes on in that passage in verse 19. It says, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts... Murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, a false witness, blasphemy, these are the things which defile man. Out of the heart the man is defiled. Why? Because he's going to allow his heart to be controlled. He's going to allow his mouth to be controlled with an evil heart. He's going to it's interesting, Proverbs tells us in Proverbs four verse twenty three, uh, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence. Be careful to guard your heart. Why? For out of your heart all things come. Or all the issues of life flows from the heart. So what's Paul telling us? Paul's telling us, take that breastplate, put it around our heart, so that our hearts may be protected. Why? Because Satan's going to try to get us to do all these kind of things. And we read a whole list there in Matthew chapter 19, or chapter 15, verse 19, a whole list of things that we can get involved in and we need to be careful of, but the Word of God makes it clear that you and I have to protect ourselves from defilement, and that defilement comes from the heart. Right. My friends, you and I have to be very careful, and we have to be willing to put on this breastplate of righteousness, as Paul calls it. Then in, the, then, then in Ephesians chapter 4 again, if we, uh, if we go back to our text, in Ephesians chapter 4, 
Um, it says, it says they were, sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. It says this, stand therefore having put on the breastplate, so we understand what standing is, okay? You and I have a standing in Christ Jesus. We need to put on this protection of the heart. Why? And it's called the protection of righteousness. How do we do this through righteousness? I want to take a few minutes and I want to look at the text that Pastor Russ read for us today. And uh, I want us to consider this idea of righteousness and what righteousness is. So go with me over to Zech Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah is the second to last book of the Old Testament. Pastor Russ read from there, and I'm going to ask you to turn there. If you, uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's a white pew Bible in the, in the pew, and I would encourage you to turn there and turn to uh, page 8-something. I forget what it was. Do you remember, Pam? Um, okay. Um, but, uh, but turn there, and in, cha in, uh, in chapter 3, verses 1 down to <coughs> verse 7, we find this whole principle of righteousness that I want, to, I, I want us to consider for a few minutes. Paul says, if you're going to do battle with Satan, and as believers you're going to do battle with Satan, you need to put on that breastplate of righteousness. So what is righteousness? Here we find a beautiful picture of what righteousness is. Let's look at that. Okay, it starts with, uh, and I'm not going to read all the verses, Pastor, read, Pastor Russ read them, so I don't have to read them again. Does anybody have a white pew Bible can tell me what page that is? 818. 818, great. Okay, so 818 for you folks who are still looking. It starts out, in, and, and it gives a picture of the vision that um, Zechariah has received. It says in verse 1, it says, And then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing uh, before the angel of the Lord. Okay? Um, I tend to believe that this is a vision that uh, Zechariah the prophet had received from God. And he sees, he sees the high priest. Zechariah was the high priest. Um, and he sees, um, uh, sorry, uh, Joshua was the high priest. And he sees the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. I believe the angel of the Lord here, okay, uh, is a reference to God. He's standing before the throne of God. I believe that this picture in this, in this prophecy or in this uh, uh, vision is that, um, is that uh, Zechariah the prophet is brought into a, a courtroom up in heaven. And in this courtroom, the Word of God tells us there in verse 1 that he's standing before the, the Lord, okay, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. So this is the picture that we have. Here, as we stand before God, on one side is Jesus Christ, on the other side we find Satan. And Satan is called in Scripture the accuser of the brethren. The Satan is called the great deceiver, the li a liar. He's the father of all liars. And the Word of God teaches us here in this vision that, uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, Zechariah, as he has this vision, he sees this courtroom taking place. And it's interesting in verse 2. Okay, verse 2 says, and the, and the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Why is, why is the Lord rebuking Satan? I believe he's rebuking Satan because Satan has just brought charges against Joshua, the high priest. He's, he's, he's talking about the, the Zechariah, uh, he's talking about Joshua and saying, Listen, this is what Joshua has done. This is. Look, look he, he, can't be, he can't be worthy of you, Lord, because of all these things. And we find that God rebukes him. Look what he says. I mean, he makes it clear in verse 2, doesn't it? He says, where, uh, where, are, uh, where are your goings? And, and, and he said to me, um, to measure Jerusalem. Um, sorry, let's try, let's, try the, let's try chapter 3, not chapter 2. It says, and the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuked thee, Satan, uh, um, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. It is, not a, uh, it is not a brand plucked from the fire. And then it goes on and says in verse 3, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Let me submit to you today that this picture of a filthy garment is a picture of personal righteousness. What I mean by personal righteousness is you and I so often stand before the Lord with our own doings. And when God looks at you and he looks at me, he sees us in filthy garments. Well, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Wait a minute. 
I do good things for God. You know what the Word of God tells us in Isaiah 64 and verse 6? The Word of God tells us this, but we are all like unclean things, and all of our righteousnesses, all of your good deeds, the people you feed, the people you help, you know, the, 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 the mission trips you've taken, all of those good things that you have done, the Word of God says, are as filthy rags. All of your righteousnesses, the Word of God says, are like filthy rags. We, we, we all fade as a leaf, and our iniquity, like the wind, have taken us away. You know, in the New Testament, we're told a similar truth. In the, in the New Testament, in, um, in, um, uh, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's right. There's nobody in this room when we stand before God in our own doings, in our own clothing, in our own works, in our own being is going to be able to stand before God holy and righteous because the Word of God says, no, your personal, uh, your personal righteousness is our filthy wrath. Boy, Pastor, that's awful harsh. I'm not saying that God is. But pastor, you don't understand. I do this, I do this, I do this. I've given, I've given thousands to the church. I don't care what you've done. God says all that you have done is a filthy rat. But, but pastor, you don't understand. Yes, I know what you're trying to say, but I can't agree with it. Why? Because God doesn't agree with it. God says your, uh, your personal righteousness is not enough. And guess what? The world, religion even says... As long as you do these certain things. God says, no, it has nothing to do with you. You cannot, you will not get to heaven in your own strength. You can't. Why? Because God says they're filthy rags. Isn't that exactly what we find here in chapter, uh, in chapter 3, in verse, uh, in verse 3 of, uh, of our text? My friends, if you've tr been trying to please God by your own righteousness, it's time today for a change to take place in your life. That's right. So how do we get to heaven? We have a problem, don't we? Everything we do is wrong. Everything we do is bad. Everything we do is, is, is filthy. Everything we do, even our good things are... And, and, and God says, I understand that. Notice what... Notice what um, Zechariah, notice what the prophet saw. He saw in verse 4, he says, Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with white robes. Amen. What did God do? God says, because you can't do it, I'm going to do it for you. Do you know what this is? This is positional righteousness. This is the righteousness that God has clothed us as we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Because God says, listen, there's, there, there's no way that man can save himself. There's no way that man can be good enough. There's no sacrifice enough to make man good enough before God. There's no payment enough that's going to take sin away. So I'm going to do it for you. And what did God do? In John chapter 3 and verse 16, God says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, in his, in his love, took His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who the Word of God says is God Himself. So God the Father took God the Son, and He, and he, he offered Him on the Calvary tree. He shed His blood for you and for me, so that when we look to Him, when we put our faith in Him, and we recognize we can't do it, He then clothes us in righteousness, so now He doesn't see us anymore as a sinner, but He sees us as righteous, before the throne of God. It's a mouthful, isn't it? But praise the Lord that He's done that for you and for me. I can't do it. You can't do it. But God did it. See, I really believe that's when Paul writes in our text in Ephesians chapter 6, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. He's talking to believers who have already had a positional place before God. 
Why? Because they are believers, they are saints, um, and, and the word saint has the idea of a believer. There are believers, they are walking faithfully with God, they are faithful to God, and Paul says, you have already done this. This is, this is what we find here in this courtroom in heaven. You know, it, um, in Psalm 51, and I know I've jumped through these, uh, probably haven't gone through all these slides, but in Psalm 51, verse 10, it talks about how David understood that he was a, he was a sinful man, and what did he do? He cried out to God. Creating me a clean heart is what, is what David cried out. Have you cried out to God for your salvation? Created me a clean heart. I think sometimes, even as a believer, I need to cry out, Lord, create in me a renewed heart. Because I've sinned. We're told in Romans chapter 3, in verse, uh, in verse 33, it says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? And then it says this, Is it not God who justifies? Who makes right? And the answer is absolutely. See, you and I have the blessing of having this eternal life given to us, this righteousness given to us by God himself. It's a gift of God. That's positional righteousness. You know, but that's not where it stops. Our text could stop right there. We could, uh, we could stop at verse 5, and it says this. It says in verse um, um, it says in verse 5 that not only did he, did, did he give him clean robes, but he gave him a, gave him a clean turban uh, to put on his head. They put a clean turban on his head, and they put robes on him, and the angels of the Lord stood by. You know, I like that idea that the angel of the Lord stood by. Jesus Christ is always standing by us. That's right. But that's not where it stops. That's not where it stops. The vision doesn't stop there. You know, the vision could have stopped there and we could say, praise the Lord, I have righteousness and this is great. I have positional righteousness and I can do. Paul, as he wrote to the church, I think it was in Corinth, uh, maybe it was in Rome, to the church at Rome, when he's dealing with grace, he says, wait a minute, because of grace, does that allow me to continue sinning? And the answer is no, it doesn't. See, we need to understand here that this vision doesn't stop with us having this positional righteousness where we say, hey, in God's eyes, we're fine, we, we, we can be found clean. But it's interesting that the angel of the Lord shows this prophet another part of this vision. And in verse 6, look what it says in verse 6. It says, then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. Why, why does the word of God use the word admonish? I think as I looked at the different translation, there's only one translation that used this word in a positive sense, not a negative sense. I know, uh, I know you and I look at admonish, and I look at admonish as a negative term. You know, you've done something wrong, you're going to be admonished for it. I tend to think what Joshua was doing here is he got these clothes, clothes on and he says, Ah, oh, praise the Lord. Now I'm in good standing with God and I can go and do whatever I want because I'm in good standing with God no matter what. Because I have these clothes of righteousness on me. And the angel of the Lord says, Admonish Joshua. He says, Wait a minute, don't think that way. Don't think that just because you have grace you can go out and sin and, and that it's, it's going to be all over. He says, no, there's a practical righteousness that has to be lived every day. And what I mean by that is just because we have, we, in heaven we have this position of righteousness, I don't always walk righteous here on earth. There was a man, there's a man that I minister to every now and then, and um, he used to say, and I'm sure he still says it, that he's perfect. He's perfect. You know, he's looking at himself in a positional way. And he says, in Jesus Christ, I am perfect. But I can tell you this, when I talk to his wife, <laughs> he's far from perfect. Okay? Why? Positionally, we're righteous in a practical sense. We have a lot of work that needs to be done. We have a lot of things that get in the way. And we need to keep our righteousness right. We need to walk in righteousness. 
And I think that's what Paul's also talking about there in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, you have put on this breastplate of righteousness, but that's, guess what, folks? If you're going to stand, and you're going to stand firm against the devil, you need to walk the talk, or you need to talk the walk. You need to walk the talk. I think that's the way it's supposed to be. You need to walk the talk and stop talking the walk. You know, we do a lot of talking and how wonderful we are in Christ and we need these doors and we live any way we want. But that's not what God wants. He's saying, listen, you are a child of God, therefore walk as a child of God. You know, it's interesting, there are a couple verses in Scripture that talk about that. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 10, and, uh, sorry, chapter 61 and verse 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in God. And then it goes on. It says this, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness as a bride decks himself with ornaments and a, uh, and a, a bride adorns herself or a bridegroom uh, decks himself with ornaments and a bridegroom adorns herself with jewels. Again, we're talking here about a positional righteousness. But, uh, but in, um, in, uh, in uh, Philippians 3.9, uh, Paul talks about the same thing. He says, And be found in him not having your own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is, uh, which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. This is a positional righteousness. Okay? Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verses 15 and 16, it tells us that there, this is now a, a, a practical righteousness. And he says, But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all what? Conduct. The way you live, you ought, to practice, you ought to be practicing holiness. You ought to be practicing righteousness. You ought to be doing what God wants you to do. So th this, brought me, this, uh, this brought me to ask myself a couple questions. How can I maintain the breastplate of righteousness? How can I do that? I think, number one, we need to let God's word dwell in us. Amen. If we're going to... Uh, maintain. I, I don't think I ever finished. If you're still in that text in, in uh, Zechariah, okay. Notice what verse seven says. After G, after um, the high priest was admonished, he was told this. Thus saith the Lord of hosts: If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my commandments, then you shall be judged. Then you shall judge my house. What he's saying is. As you obey me and walk in me, then you have this practical righteousness. How do we maintain it? By letting the word dwell in us. You might say, well, what are you saying there? See, I, I, I want you to understand that so often we dwell in the word, and I'm not talking about dwelling in the word. I'm talking about allowing the word to dwell in you. There's a big difference there. See, when I dwell in the Word, I spend time reading God's Word. When the Word dwells within me, it's now ministering to me and changing my life. It's interesting, there's a, uh, there's a Bible verse, we have this, and um, you know, we've been going through bibliology, and one of those terms of bibliology you have in your bulletin this week, if you've read it, is the term inspiration. And, um, you know, but, uh, uh, but it comes from this, this verse. In this verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed, is inspired by God, and is profitable. Notice what it's profitable for. For, do for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. What's that verse talking about? Why is Paul using these different terms, doctrine and reproof and correction and instru instruction? Basically what he's saying is this. The Word of God is given to us so that we would know how to walk with God. That's what walk with God, walk in righteousness. That's what Paul's talking about. We need to allow the Word to come into us and to change us and make us to be like Him. The whole goal of the Christian is to become like Christ. The believers in the early church were called Christians. That was not a that was not a a, uh, a positive term. That was a negative term. Oh, look at those followers of Jesus, Christian. It was a term that people used to make fun of the Christian of the uh, of the believers. 
Why? Because they wanted to be just like their master. They wanted to be just like their savior. And that's what you and I need to be. How do we do that? By allowing the word of God to dwell in our hearts richly. Secondly, offer yourself to God as a slave to righteousness. What, what, what's this? How do I offer myself to God? You know, the Word of God says that we have a choice. We either serve to one of two masters. We either serve God or we serve Satan. One or the other. Who are we going to yield to? Who are we going to surrender to? Who are we going to give our life to? Who are we going to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to give you this? I think it's a choice we make every morning. Who I'm going to surrender. And I don't think it's only every morning. I think every decision you make throughout the day, you have to ask yourself, is this something that God would want me to do or not? Amen. And we will know the answer to that the more we're in the Word of God and the more the Word of God dwells within us. But we need to understand, we need to offer ourselves. Uh, Paul deals with this in, in Romans. Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 6, and verse 19. He says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. He says, I want to make it this simple for you. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to say it as simply as I can. He says, for just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness, he says, and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. He says, so now, present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. When I read the word present your members, I always go back to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Yeah. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Giving ourselves on a daily basis over to the Lord on an hourly basis. Lord, I am yours. This is the picture that we have. This is how you and I can maintain this righteousness in our lives. We need to be willing to allow God's Word to richly dwell in us. And then secondly, we need to offer ourselves as sacrifices unto righteousness. The, um, that brought me to another question. And that question is, what are the benefits? See, what difference does it make if we really put on the breastplate of righteousness or not? What difference does it make? Well, I think for you and I, as we fight a battle, I think there's four things that are very, very crucial. Number one, deliverance. The Word of God tells us the righteousness of the upright will deliver them. I like that. Our righteous walk will deliver us. It doesn't mean we're, not, we're going to not go through any problems, but the Word of God promises that when we go through problems, He will be there with us to minister to us. That's the promise God made. Deliverance. You know, we've all been through problems in our life. Some of you are going through problems right now. You know, as you walk righteously. Well, you know, if I, if, if I do this this way, if I do that that way, you know, and I, I cheat a little bit here, or cheat a little bit there, it's going to be more beneficial. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The Word of God says walk righteously. Do it the right way before God. And God will bless you for it. There's a second thing. He brings honor. You know, when we walk rightly before God, there's honor that goes along with it. In Proverbs 21, 21, we're told this. He who follows righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. You know, you want honor in your life. You want people to respect you. You want people to honor you. You want people to, you know, and I'm even going to say this. You want people to like you. Walk in righteousness. Well, well, wait a minute, the Word of God says if I walk in righteousness, people aren't going to like me because they're not going to like what, what I do for the Lord. No, but you're going to have a peace. And, you know, I have found, this is my personal, you know, I have found that most people like people who are doing the right thing. Now, some people don't like it. I remember, um, I remember when I was in, uh, in French schools and um, in... Uh, I, I would always get yelled at by the other kids because I always shot the, um, what is it, the, 
uh, the grade the, the grade curve. Okay, not because I had high high grades. I always had low grades, but I always shot the curve because I wasn't wasn't about to cheat. I didn't care if I failed if I failed that test. I wasn't going to cheat. Okay, and um, and kids didn't like that. You know, but I was going to do the right thing. Teacher, teacher didn't like me very much. That's a whole different story. <laughs> but I was going to do the right thing before the Lord, because I wasn't serving the teacher. I was serving the Lord, even in this school. That's how you need to walk. That's what God says. The benefit of doing that is what honor, life, righteousness. There's a third thing that we're that the Word of God talks about, and that's confidence. In Isaiah 32 and verse 17, we're told this. It says, the work of the righteous will be peace, and the effects of righteousness, quietness, assurance forever. That term assurance is that term confidence. I'm going to have confidence forever. I'm going to be able to stand, no matter what happens, no matter what, what goes on. Hey, the government says we have to shut down the country because of COVID-19. It doesn't matter because I have confidence that God is in full control. The market seems to be playing some funny games lately. Have you noticed that? You know, I, I, I look at my retirement and I think to myself, you know, I might be better off if I take my money out of my retirement and I put it in a shoebox and hide it in my attic. <laughs> Because, the, because the, the, the money which used to be here is now here, and all I can see is it going down here. I called, my, I called the man who invests my money, not Pam's money, I invest my money. And, um, she, and, and I said, hey, I, I have this money I want to invest. And he said, put it in the bank, you'll get more interest than you would, uh, than you would on, on investing. Well, what are we going to do? You know, I, I'm already 59 years old, and another couple of years, you know, I, I'm going to have to be dependent upon, yeah, I'm dependent upon God. Because right. I am confident that God will take care of me. That's what the Word of God says. I don't have to fear. You know, yes, my body's falling apart, and yes, I'm getting older, and yes, my, my sleep isn't where it ought to be, and yes, my, my memory's not where it ought to be, and yes, I you know, have to wear name tags around the house because I can't remember my wife's name half the time. Um, <laughs> you know, and yes, I walk into a room and wonder, why in the world did I come into this room for? So I walk back into the living room, then I remember in the living room why I went into the dining room. <laughs> You're laughing because you do the same thing, I know that. <laughs> But Lord, I, 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 I'm, you know, it doesn't matter what this world is doing. Because my God, as I understand my God, He is in control of all things. And I need to be willing to say, I am confident, I know that I know that I know Amen. that God. That's confidence. The Word of God promises that confidence when we walk in righteousness. He doesn't promise that confidence when we do it our own way. Remember that. Well, Pastor, I don't understand why all this is falling apart. And, and are you walking with the Lord? No, no, I'm not really walking with the Lord. But, but that's not the issue. Yes, it is the issue. That is the issue. That is exactly what you and I need is to be walking the way God wants us to walk. Then there's a final thing. There's provision. There's provision. God provides for you and for me. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says, we started our, our, um, we started our service with this verse. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things. What's the context of that verse? It's talking about clothes to wear. It's talking about food to eat. And uh, Jesus is saying, listen, when you walk in me and in my righteousness, all things will be added unto you. Everything else. You don't have to worry about it. Trust me. I will make sure and I will provide for you. That's what righteousness does. For you and for me. There's a, there was one other question that I asked myself. And, uh, you know, we've talked about these four things that, that are, are benefits for living righteous. Um, you know, you and I however, need to, uh, need to know and we need to ask ourselves the question, are we first of all saved? 
Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you surrendered to His will? You know, I, I love that verse that says, Not my will, but thine will be done. My friends, have you experienced that walking with the Lord the way He wants you to walk with Him? You know, go with me back to Ephesians chapter, <coughs> chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. In verse, um, in verse 14, Paul is talking about standing for Jesus Christ. And he says, listen, stand for Him by putting on the belt of truth and by walking righteously. Because you are righteous. So therefore, walk that way. Go over with me again to chapter 4 and verse 1 where Paul started this whole section on practical living for God. And he says, my friend, will you walk worthy of that calling that God has called you to live? If you are a Christian today, the walk that God has called you to walk is a walk of righteousness. Look what it says. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. God clothed you in righteousness if you know him. And he asks you to walk with him. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Lord, help us to walk in righteousness today. Lord, help us to walk in you. Who clothed us in righteousness. But Lord, help us demonstrate that day by day. Lord, I do that. Before I say amen, I want to ask you this question. Are you walking in righteousness today? Yes, maybe you're here. Maybe you have accepted Jesus. I'm not talking about those who are visiting today who do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about those who, who know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Are you walking in righteousness the way God wants you to walk? If you recognize that maybe you're not walking the way God wants you to walk, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to change a little bit. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How about if you're thank you? How about if you're here today and you've never experienced Jesus Christ? You've never accepted him. How can you do what God wants you to do if you haven't surrendered to him in the first place? Are you willing right now to say, Pastor, I, I want to surrender my life to God? I've never done that before. Oh, I, I, I might say that I'm a Christian, but I really have never really claimed the blood of Jesus Christ to wash me as white as snow, to give me righteousness. Would you say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm really struggling. Anybody? Father, thank you for the hands that went up today. And I ask that you would help us walk in righteousness. I thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.